Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christina Dickerson. I'm the vice chair of the board of Life Moves. And on behalf of Matthew Bells, our board chair, current and former board members, and the Life Moves staff, welcome to the third annual Mid Peninsula Lunch. And what a turnout. Pretty awesome. I'm especially thrilled to have our very esteemed and, in my opinion, rock star panelists here today to discuss the importance of a public and private collaboration in breaking the cycle of homelessness. I'd also like to welcome our elected officials and their representatives who are here with us today. So if I could have you all stand to be recognized when I call out your name, and we have a pretty lengthy list, so sit tight. First of all, Dave Cortese, the president of the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors. Joe Simidian, the Vice President of the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors, and last year's moderator. Carol Groom, Supervisor from San Mateo County. Donna Rutherford, East Palo Alto City Council. Elizabeth Lewis, Atherton Town Council and former mayor. Kathy Watanabe, Santa Clara City Council. Rich Gordon, former state assembly member. <laughs> Brian Perkins, representing Congressman Jackie Spear. Alex Kobayashi, representing State Senator Jerry Hill. Tim Orozco, representing State Senator Bob Wykowski. Ben Cohn, representing State Assembly Member Kevin Mullen. And Zach Ross, representing Assembly Member Mark Berman. If I have inadvertently missed anybody, please stand up and wave your hands wildly in the air. Or write your name on a card and we'll recognize you properly. Um, I want to take one housekeeping note before I give you a, a few remarks. There are cards on your table. Those cards are meant for you to ask questions uh, of the panel. Once you have a card filled out, just hold your, hand, hold your card in the air anytime during the lunch, and our staff will pick it up and we'll collate the questions to be asked to the panel when we get to the Q&A part. So let us know if you have questions. I want to take another moment to personally thank every single person in this room today, especially our host committee who are listed on the back of the flyer that you have here who are exceptionally dedicated to this organization, and of course, our corporate sponsors with whom we could not have had this luncheon and let alone do any of the other projects that we do. Those sponsors are Therma, who's our presenting sponsor, Palantir, Argonaut, Dome Construction, Wells Fargo, and Franklin Templeton, and they deserve a big round of applause. Thank you all for your support of our Life Moves mission and for your continued participation in our organization. So the issues of homelessness and working to overcome them have been a passion of mine for really more than three decades, which means I've just told you all how old I am. It's touched my life in every place I've lived, which are every major city in this country from the East Coast to the South to the Midwest and now the West Coast. And I can tell you firsthand that no place and no region is immune to this problem. We seem to see it quite a bit more on the West Coast, however. My commitment to the cause started long ago in New York City when my mother-in-law invited me to join her on the Covenant House bus that rode around in the middle of the night delivering services to the homeless. It was an incredibly eye-opening experience for a young investment banker at the time. And it ignited a lifelong desire to try to help right this social wrong. More recently, I have been privileged to serve on the board of Life Moves for over a decade. I work with an 
truly incredible staff that helps our clients return to a permanent home and to self-sufficiency. And thanks to the exceptional programs and services, most never return. This organization, as you all know, does truly great work, as do our public and private partners who collaborate to help solve this problem. Many of you are in this room today. And again, I can't say thank you enough for all of your generosity. Our entire community benefits from your involvement with us. I'm looking very forward to all of the perspectives and insights that our panel will share shortly with us on their strategic vision for a public-private collaboration in breaking the cycle of homelessness. These are really uncertain times. Funding is completely unknown. It's crucial that we have this conversation in our backyard, at the local level, and right now. With that, it is my great pleasure to introduce Bruce Ives, the CEO of Life Moves, who will moderate the panel today. Bruce has, oh, he doesn't get off that easy. <laughs> Bruce has an awesome resume, as many of you know, and is an exceptional leader but I promised him I would only highlight a few of his attributes today. Bruce, as you know, came to us from Hewlett Packard, most recently as the Deputy General Counsel, and has been the CEO of Life Moves for exactly two years. In fact, today is his two-year anniversary. He started his career on the peninsula working for Congresswoman Anna Eshoo, so he has tremendous public experience. During his 19-year tenure in private industry at HP, Bruce founded and led their international pro bono legal program and is familiar, therefore, with public-private collaboration. His skills are perfect to lead this effort. Bruce shares my passion to, br to break the cycle of homelessness in our community. And without further ado, please welcome Bruce Ives. Thank you, Christina, for that generous introduction. Uh, I'd like to thank our vice chair and all of our board members who are here with us today and who give such vital hands-on support to Life Moves all throughout the year. A um, Couple of quick introductions. Um, first, I want to welcome Jose Salcido, who's here with us today, representing C San Jose City Council Member Johnny Camus. Jose, thank you for joining us. And we want to jump right into the program so we can make the most of our time. So I'm going to ask the panelists to come up and get seated. And while they're doing that, I'm going to introduce a very special guest. Um, President of the Board of Supervisors, Dave Cortese, has graciously agreed to kick off our program um, and take time out of his busy schedule to give us a brief perspective from the public sector side about the need for public-private collaboration as a way to kick off our panel. So without further ado, Supervisor Dave Cortese. Well, thank you so much, Bruce. Um, thank you, all of you, for being here and for supporting Life Moves and uh, the great work that it does. Um, and I'm just privileged to be here to speak to all of you uh, for just a few minutes. Um, I'm going to speak uh, on the county's role um, in the fight and homelessness, uh, which has been a major priority of mine uh, for the last several years as president of the Board of Supervisors. And uh, I will tell you a major um, a major priority of Vice President of the Board, Joe Sabidian, who is here uh, as well. And I think that goes without saying, most of you have probably read of his significant efforts um, to uh, mitigate homelessness, uh, including right here uh, in, in this particular area. Uh, all of our efforts really started with the, the premise that collaboration is necessary a few years ago, and the brickwork was laid with, um, I think, two important actions. One. Um, one was something that we just call now a cost study or the cost study, um, and that was something that was called for by one of our colleagues, uh, Supervisor Mike Wasserman, a few years ago as he was our liaison to the destination home effort uh, of the Health Trust, which primarily helps pull together the city of San Jose and the county of Santa Clara on issues. And Mike asked the question, 
what does it cost us not to end homelessness? What is it costing us uh, to deal with the homeless through purely through safety net service out on the streets? Um, that told us that the persistently homeless uh, identified as 2,800 of the 5,500 I'm sorry, 6,500 homeless at the time were costing us about $50,000 a year more each, each person, than it would be um, if we housed them and wrapped services around them. Um, so we realized right there that we had a, a, a business model and a potential collaboration with others that would make sense. Secondly, in 2015, it called for the formation of the Santa Clara County Housing Task Force. It wasn't the first task force uh, on this subject ever created, but it was one uh, that was very much bipartisan, so to speak, business interests, labor interests, uh, and stakeholders from all over the county. And they were tasked in seven months to come up with concrete solutions and new business models to deal with this issue. Out of that came a range of recommendations that included expanding transitional housing, uh, medical and mental health services, and a host of other life-saving measures, many of which have funded and implemented and have touched the lives of your clients here at Life Moves. Um, and, and, and we funded those uh, to the tune of over $60 million almost immediately. Uh, but we realized coming out of that task force that we needed to link up foundations and individuals and corporate giving and CBOs, um, as well as, of course, uh, our own role, the government sector. We need to take really those four sectors and link them all together. And one of the models that came forward was something we now call pay for success, uh, which uh, uh, led to the formation of the first social impact bond project in, in the country, or at least one of the first, certainly the first in California, called Project Welcome Home. Um, and I want to thank um, John Sobrato, who is uh, one of the panelists here today, uh, and his foundation for being one of the first upfront investors in saying, we're willing to invest uh, in a program that draws down payment as we verify that we're actually housing people new business model and one that is being expanded as we speak at the County of Santa Clara. Not a grant program, but a contract for services that say, show us uh, the delivery and we'll pay you the dollars. Um, that's a way to get business folks and foundations involved. Uh, the most impressive collaboration by far uh, is Measure A, of course, the $950 million housing bond that passed in the November 26th election, thanks in a large part to all of you and to the voters, of course, in Santa Clara County. Um, again, I want to uh, single out Mr. Sobrato, who's uh, been sort of at the private sector uh, forefront of this whole movement. He co-chaired uh, that campaign along with me uh, and uh, a fellow, uh, a colleague of ours uh, on the Board of Supervisors, Supervisor Cindy Chavez, as most of you know, effectively chaired that campaign and really took the bull by the horns, made sure that we were successful. We were successful by 0.88%. Um, had we lost any of that margin, uh, we wouldn't be talking about that being a successful endeavor here today. $700 million of that money is going to ELI housing, um, a, of course, a sector of housing that never really had any government support for all intents and purposes uh, in the past. We expect to leverage that those dollars uh, to the tune of $3 billion uh, before we're done. Uh, take a moment to think about uh, what the impact uh, is going to be of nearly 5,000 new uh, permanent supportive affordable housing units and what that effect will have on the lives of, of clients like Life Moves clients and so many other homeless individuals and families who struggle every day just to stay alive. On that note, probably the most important business model that we have is a way of thinking, a way of thinking now that I think is different uh, than how we thought about this issue in the past. Um, and that is, um, I think, very relevant to what I've called uh, as president of the board in this year, uh, 2017, the year of compassion in Santa Clara County. And that is this, we're not here to rescue your clients and you're not here for that either, nor are we here to rescue our constituents. They want to be partners. They want to be part of the business model. And they want to be partners with us in their own liberation. Um, that's what we're all about now in Santa Clara County. Hopefully, uh, that's what all of you are all about here in supporting our efforts. And hopefully, the panel will uh, help to enlighten us more on just how to do that um, bigger and better and more effectively in the future. Thank you again so much for being here. And thank you for inviting me.
Thank you, Supervisor Cortese. We appreciate your remarks, and, and thank you, too, for all of your leadership uh, on behalf of the county in the fight against homelessness. Uh, we have a great panel lined up, um, and rather than introduce them and read you their long biographies, let's just jump right in. So I'll ask them all to introduce themselves as they give you each a brief overview of the wonderful work that they're doing in our community. So we can start right here to my immediate left. I'll ask uh, Mr. Sobrato to go first. Good afternoon. Good. We've been in the valley. Our family's been in the valley. Microphone's on, please. Oh, excuse me. I forgot to turn this on. <laughs> Good afternoon. Anyway, our family uh, has been in the real estate development business for long before it was known as Silicon Valley. I think the first building I built for Lockheed was back in 1968. And um, we're sort of in the right place at the right time. So we just felt we're obligated now that uh, we have built a successful business to kind of share some of that success, success with the folks in our community uh, that uh, need a helping hand. And whether it's homelessness or you name it, we support a lot of different social service agencies. But I was particularly interested on the homeless side. Uh, I've been a board member of Destination Home that Dave has spoken about for a number of years and uh, was very pleased to see them uh, uh, instigate this pay for success program. So our foundation uh, helped fund that uh, by making a, what we call a program related investment. And uh, we'll get paid back, provided it's a successful program. And so far, it looks like it's fulfilling uh, its mission. Uh, so when Cindy Chavez asked me to help on the Measure A campaign, I was all for it. Uh, because what we've seen happen uh, on the development side is all these cities are passing affordable housing fees. They're passing homeless fees. And of course, all this does is raise the cost of the housing that we provide. And you know, it gets to the point now where it's just so, you know, only 20% of the population can afford to live here. We have people uh, con uh, con contemplating leaving our valley. So we have to do something to bring down the cost of housing. And we have to do something to shelter uh, the homeless folks. And as Dave pointed out, the most expensive homeless person that the county has to uh, cover is a chronically homeless person. So, and, and unfortunately, a lot of these individuals have got mental health issues, they have substance abuse issues. And so we need to provide 24 7 supportive services on site. And of course, Life Moves you know, does a wonderful job on the existing facilities that they have here. Um, so, in any event, when Cindy asked me to uh, co-chair of the uh, uh, Measure A campaign, I was 100% for it, because instead of just the development community trying to help pay for some of the cost of homelessness, it gets spread across the entire county. Every taxpayer in Santa, in Santa Clara County will have a slight increase in their tax uh, property tax bill. Every business owner will have a slight increase in their use tax for their equipment. And so, you know, this burden gets spread across everyone. Someone with a $500,000 assessed valuation of a home in Santa Clara County will cost them about $60 additional in property tax. So we were able to sell the program. Uh, Dave and I kind of double teamed and met with the Chamber of Commerce and talked to them, met with the, real estate, the Silicon Valley Real Estate Board to try to convince some of these business groups to. Uh, if, if not support the uh, bond, but at least not to oppose it. So we're very fortunate that it did pass uh, slightly, just a little bit over two thirds. So we'll turn it over. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Meredith Liu. I am the co founder and president of the Primary School. Um, the Primary School is a relatively new nonprofit that is working in East Palo Alto with children and families. And the well, we, we started the primary school, myself and um, my co-founder, Priscilla Chan, who is a pediatrician, um, coming from two sectors, her from health and me from education, where 
we were really frustrated with what was possible for our high poverty children and our children of color and feeling like no matter how hard we worked, it was impossible to work within a system that was structured to support a different kind of child. And that there was, no matter what we did, no matter how many innovations there were, we couldn't really keep our children healthy or have them achieve the type of educational outcomes that would actually break the cycle of poverty. So the primary school was really founded out of that kind of uh, frustration with the existing system and the desire to say, if we could start from scratch and really provide the best things possible for our highest need children, what would that system look like? Um, and we came up with a, um, a model after talking to many families, um, many practitioners and policymakers as well about what would it look like from scratch. And there were three key elements that we're implementing. Uh, the first is that you really need to bring health and education together. Uh, it is impossible to keep a, a child healthy over the long term who isn't educated, and it's pretty impossible to educate a child who has severe health issues as well. They're working against each other, so how do we bring those two systems together? Um, the second was that you've got to start earlier. I personally came from working in high schools, um, and we know now so much about the science of early childhood. The majority of brain development happens from zero to five. We know about the impact of trauma on children that is not irreversible, but has a truly lasting impact. And the fact that our public education system catches kids after this period um, is just simply not early enough. Uh, and the third piece, which I think is very related to Life Moves work is that you've got to put this parent at the center. The parent is the most powerful person in a child's life. They care more about them than anyone, and they have an enormous amount of influence and the desire to do amazing things for their children. So these three elements, the integration of health uh, and education, the support for parents, and starting early are the three things that formed our model. Um, and so we have been operating um, for a very short period of time since August in East Palo Alto. We're currently working with 250 families between the ages of six months and about five years old. Uh, they, are, they start our program really at birth and work with us in an integrated model where we support parents uh, with family coaching that really asks them what their goals are and what they want to achieve and also builds a sense of group cohesion and community that lets families know they're not alone and that they can achieve these amazing things. We also work really closely with the healthcare system. Um, in particular, our healthcare partner in East Palo Alto, which is the Ravenswood Family Health Center, to really bring together the health services they're offering with the family services that we're offering as well. And then we have full-time school, which starts at age three. So we're really catching two years of preschool as well. Um, and we're, we're very new, we're learning a lot. Um, but what has been really clear to us is that that family piece and the home life is the foundation for everything that comes afterwards. Uh, and we, we've talked a lot about what we need to add to our model. And housing is the number one issue faced by our families. And we have, a, we have a lot of families that are homeless. We have a lot of children who are homeless. And if you can imagine what it means to come to school and try to learn after sleeping in a car for the evening, or somewhere else, or being in a chaotic household where there's 10 people sleeping in a room uh, and asking someone to learn reading or math. And that is the, that's the struggle that we're working with. And so we're, we're really lucky to be able to work with partners like Life Moves. We have a number of families who are part of the program. And I know it's been unbelievable to work with them. And we're actually trying to build a holistic solution that creates that healthy foundation for children to be able to learn and to be able to be, edu um, to be healthy as well. And having these pieces come together in a comprehensive model is what we think we really need to have that kind of success that's actually going to break the cycle of poverty. Thank you, Meredith. Before we move to Daniel, I'm going to switch out and give you this mic because I think we're getting a little bit of feedback with the wireless mics. I Dang. was wondering whose fault that was. <laughs> yeah, it was my fault. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm Daniel Lurie, CEO and founder of Tipping Point, and I'll start you just with a, I'll, I'll be brief. 600,000 people are living below the federal poverty line, which is $23,000 a year for a family of four uh, here in the Bay Area. You're not in this room if you don't know that. You all know that. So what we look at is sort of the self-sufficiency line, and that is 
whether someone has to choose between putting food on the table or paying their rent. And that number goes up to 1.3 million people here in the Bay Area who have to make those type of choices out of about six and a half million people. That's unacceptable in an area as wealthy as this one with the leaders. <laughs> and we started Tipping Point almost 12 years ago to tackle those problems. And we, Meredith uh, summed it up really well. We believe there's no silver bullet. Education is absolutely essential. 45% um, of our funding goes to our education portfolio, but we have three other portfolios as well, housing, employment, and health. So we have four, because we believe that if you send a kid to a great school, but they don't have housing, they're not going to succeed. If parents don't have a living wage job, they're not going to succeed. And if they don't have access to quality and high quality health care, they're not going to succeed. So we currently are funding 44 organizations throughout the Bay Area. A third of our programs are here in the peninsula and South Bay, a third in the city, a third in the East Bay with a couple in Marin County. And we have come to the conclusion, which many of you have already come to this conclusion, it took me a little while longer than, than most, um, is that we can't direct service our way out of this problem. We have to partner, like John did with city council here, uh, we have to leverage government dollars. And so we are jumping into the policy realm, um, focusing first on chronic homelessness in San Francisco. We have a lot to learn from Santa Clara. Uh, and so we are going to study your model. I was just meeting with John last week about how we can do some things differently as a city in San Francisco, but also as a region. Because as you all know, this homeless problem is not a Santa Clara problem or a San Francisco problem or an Oakland problem. It's a regional problem. So we all need to work together and look forward to talking more. Thank you. Um, so let me pitch another question to you because you've alluded to this, Daniel, in, in your answers. I mean, you all work with your own organizations, which are known for being fast moving, decisive, pretty nimble. But when you go to collaborate with the public sector, you could be buying into a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of red tape. So why go the collaboration route at all? Why not just do it on your own? Well, so our model, which I didn't explain, 100% of our dollars raised each year go out the door. We have no endowment. So last year we raised $22 million, and we give out all $22 million this year. Uh, we insist on accountability, and we insist that groups are willing to take a hard look at themselves. And that's why we're proud of our partnership with Life Moves. Um, and I think that the public sector looks at an organization like Tipping Point, or an organization or you know a business leader like John and they say we want to partner with them we want more accountability in the public sector we want more nimble flexible dollars that can unlock the scalable dollars which are government dollars so for years we've been making a phone call here or a phone call there to different you know whether it was leader Pelosi or whether it was a city council person in, in or a mayor mayor Licardo or mayor Schaff or mayor Lee and we'd say listen we have a great group that is, is you know, doing something really well, but they need scale. And we are not going to provide that private sector. No matter how m many philanthropic dollars you have, you're never going to match what's available at the government level. And so we had to overcome that, you know, the, 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 how slow government can be at times. And when we've had our discussions with City Hall in San Francisco, they have welcomed us in. Mayor Lee has asked us to come in and work with his department heads. The department heads have welcomed us with open arms. Now, the proof will be in the pudding, um, but uh, we can't solve the problem of homelessness unless government steps up and does its job better. Meredith, how about you? And Daniel's going to pass you the microphone because oh, he's going to collaborate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just echo the fact that there is no way we're gonna solve this problem without public sector buy-in and leveraging those dollars and those systems. That is that is our system of care for children, families, and all of us, and it is incredibly critical that we leverage that. And so um, 
yes, it's easier to move as a private organization, but it's absolutely worth it to partner with the public sector. Um, our model at the primary school, we, we say we have a two-part mission, and the first is to provide exceptional, life-changing outcomes for the children and families that we work with and really support them in achieving what is possible. Uh, but the second part of our mission is to build a model that is scalable and sustainable in the public sector. And we would not be putting the effort that we are into refining what we're doing if we didn't think it could benefit millions of children. And the only way to do that is to build it in a way that it could be adopted publicly. Um, so we are very fortunate in our current partnerships, not only uh, nonprofit organizations, but we work very closely with the county, particularly family health services. We work really closely with the city of East Palo Alto, which has been a tremendous supporter for our work. Our federally qualified health center is largely publicly funded, and we work really closely with the school district as well. And part of that is so that we can provide supports, but also so that we can learn about what works. We purposely constrain ourselves to the level of funding, the regulations, the different things that would be expected in the public sector and in these other public systems. Uh, and that is completely critical to our mission and the way we work. And we are really committed to learning in a way that can be adopted elsewhere. Great. And John, your thoughts? Well, we're fortunate in Santa Clara County because under Dave's leadership, uh, we were able to pass this $950 million proposition, a bond, 750000 of which is slated for very low income folks, uh, primarily that would be homeless. The difficulty is, is that where are you going to build these units? In San Francisco, there are a lot of single occupancy, older buildings that can be converted. But believe me, when you go to start from scratch and build a project, that's when we need everybody in this room to show up at a council meeting, because if you're interested in solving homelessness, we need more advocates. The only folks that ever show up are the, you know, not in my backyard neighbors. And this doesn't matter whether if it's, if it's in a business neighborhood the business operators are concerned about uh, chronically homeless folks wandering around, loitering in front of their stores, panhandling. If it's near a residential neighborhood, those folks are concerned about, you know, what the impact is going to be on their kids, maybe walking to school, playing in the parks, etc. So there's some great agencies. I mean, Life Moves, one of them, they've been able to prove they can provide the supportive services to control these issues. But it's still a hard sell. We need more demonstration sites um, to show uh, the residents here in Santa Clara County that this can work. So I know we've got the money now, but now we need to find the sites. And that means, frankly, uh, with land selling for three or four million dollars an acre now in Silicon Valley, we really need to have land from the public sector at no cost to get the cost down so somebody with a voucher uh, can pay their share of the rent, um, Section 8 vouchers. And so Santa Clara County has the money. Santa Clara County, though, has very, very few sites. That's the problem of where we can locate a new uh, supportive housing project. And uh, I've been working with uh, the county, and you know, I can tell you, I can count on one hand the sites that might work. And you know, what did we talk about? Four thousand folks that are you know, thirty-five hundred that are chronically homeless. Yeah. Housing families is a lot easier. Homeless families, because there you can uh, build a residential project and have a mix of uh, units. Some that could be market rate, and, and you know, that market rate can subsidize the below market rate. And that works for families. But when you get into the supportive side, uh, the cost of providing 24-7 services, whether it's counseling, whether it's helping with job placements, this is very, very expensive. And you know, fortunately, we have the money now in the county. So uh, once these sites are identified, I hope everybody that's in this room will pay attention and be an advocate at a council meeting and say, you know, neighbors, this is something we need to do. Let's be compassionate. Let's not, you know, build a drawbridge between those folks and our neighborhood and give us, you know, some help. And that's the only way we're going to get anywhere close to solving the problem.
Great, thank you. I mean, let me pitch one back to you, Daniel, and like the other panelists to comment as well. We've had some comments now from some folks that they kind of look at the problem of homelessness itself, and they say it's so big, it's so complex. You've got addiction issues, you've got mental health issues, you've got the cost of housing. Is homelessness a problem that's so big that it really can't be solved? Do you think homelessness is a solvable problem? Yes. Right? <laughs> that's, why we're, that's why you guys do the work that you do. That's why we have to remain optimistic. If you're, if you're in this room, if you're an elected official, if you're philanthropic in any sense, you have to remain optimistic. Now, you then have to break it down. You have to break the problem down. So how we're looking at it in, up in San Francisco, because I agree we need pilot and test sites, is that we looked at this issue of homelessness and we have eight to 10,000 people that are homeless on a given night in San Francisco. There's a lot of people working on, not a lot, but there's people working on family homelessness and there's people working on veterans homelessness. But there are 1,700 to 2,000 and we know that that's just a proxy number, but that's about the number of people that are chronically homeless. And so tipping point, because we, we like going after the hardest to serve and the toughest, um, the, the, the areas that are not well funded, um, people are not thinking about those people that are you know, a drug addicted and mentally ill that are living on the streets of San Francisco. And so that's, we're breaking it down to that number. So we're going after that population. That's what we're working on with uh, the city and county of San Francisco. And then you can start getting some wins. Veterans homelessness has dropped dramatically in this country. There's a lot of funding going into it, which is excellent and we need more of it. Family homelessness, there are a number of corporations working on it alongside Mark Benioff. Um, uh, Airbnb just jumped in in San Francisco. The G San Francisco Giants just jumped in on family homelessness. So we need people to go in their lanes and just drill down and do all they can on those issues and then it's solvable. So I think you have to remain optimistic and you have to break it down into you know, bite-sized pieces. Great. And, and Meredith, it's, some people would say maybe the only thing more broken than our housing system is our education system. Is education fixable? I was gonna. I was gonna say. I, I don't. We're working on fixing education and healthcare. Um, so we haven't tackled homelessness yet. But I. I absolutely think education is fixable. I know I wouldn't get up every day if I didn't think it was. And. Um, and I think you know, to harp on the point again, these are interrelated issues. And I really agree that we need to break down the problem. And we also need to get to it where it starts in addition to providing the supports for folks who are homeless right now. And um, education, it works for many, many children. It works in other countries. It works for some of our children who are high need. It is absolutely a solvable issue. And I think with a well-educated population, with a healthy population, particularly mental health, which is a huge contributor to homelessness, then these problems are all solvable. It is, I absolutely believe it's possible to live in a world where everybody is healthy, happy, um, and can have a good life. And I think that's really what we're talking about here. John, what do you think? Well, like a tipping point, our foundation probably grants a third of our annual support to all sorts of charter schools, teacher development um, programs, um, and this is the surest way out of poverty is a good education, so we certainly agree. Hold on to it for a second, I want to follow up. Um, let's get personal for a second, if you would. Agree that you, you all think these problems are solvable, and I do too, uh, but it's still really hard work. Um, so John, what motivates you? Why take on these challenges? Why take on all this hard work? What's, what's your personal motivation here? Well, I retired uh, several years ago <laughs> from the, uh, uh, our real estate development side. My son did a good job as CEO for some 25 years, and now we have gentleman by the name of Rob Hollister that's been running our real estate side for the past three or four years. So it gives me more time to work on these sort of issues and uh, I don't think they'll get solved in my lifetime but at least we're going to hopefully make a dent. And uh, talking about housing in general 
And it's, it's not just housing for homeless. We have to provide more housing of all, all sorts. And uh, the issue is, is that in order to make the housing more affordable, you'd have to go up. You need to build taller buildings. And cities like Menlo Park, Palo Alto, have a 50-foot height limit, which means you can build a four-story uh, multifamily building. Now, there's some enlightened cities like uh, San Jose, where there's an awful lot of high-rise housing going. The city of Mountain View is looking at uh, multi-story housing over in the shoreline area where, where Google's located. Um, but uh, you know, we have people that complain in Menlo Park that they can't hire policemen, uh, first responders, they can't afford to live there. But yet, you know, hey, we can't build anything over 50 feet. You know, no way. And so that has to change. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you know, there's also a big concern about traffic. But I'm a believer in this autonomous driving vehicle that we'll probably see on our streets in three or four years. Um, I think uh, what's going to happen on the traffic side is, is the software is being developed as we speak that's going to be able to match three or four riders in a vehicle that be, want to go to a particular location. Uh, and that hasn't worked with public transportation, with buses, with light rail. You know, there's very, very few riders. So I think uh, the Uber solution is going to solve our traffic problem long term without having to build more lanes. Uh, and this will allow, I hope, uh, more housing to be built in its place instead of parking lots. Great. So, Meredith, if you would share a little bit about your personal motivation for the hard work that you're doing at the primary school. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think I speak for, I have a, I want to shout out a couple of my colleagues who are here from the primary school as well who work with our families. And we are working very, very hard. The work is incredibly difficult. It's in incredibly long hours and emotionally taxing. And we, so we talk a lot about why we're here. And I personally, I, I grew up in, in DC, which and went to DC public schools. And it is a city of haves and have nots, just like um, San Francisco is in like much of the Bay Area. And um, I honestly think this is just a moral justice issue. And I, uh, <laughs> I think a lot of us do, and that's why we're here. And um, I, I don't, I do not think that this is the way the world has to be. And I think that there are, when I work with families and have for a long time, they, their children deserve as much as my children would, or as much as I deserved growing up, and as much as anyone in this room does. And and I think too, I, I will say it's it's not just about the this kind of lofty moral goal. It is a joy to work with families and children every day. Um, it is, our families are fantastic, they're wonderful, they are passionate, and I, I get a lot of joy out of just being with them, and so there's that too. I, I like to avoid personal questions. Um, <laughs> so uh, Melissa Wang, who is our Deputy Director of Programs, and I, who's here, she and I get fired up by working with the leaders and the teams at our organization. So Bruce, I'd like to ask what gets you fired up. Oh, <laughs> totally unfair. Um, so what motivates me? Um, so it's somebody alluded to earlier today, it's been two years to the day in the job. Um, and then clearly I was drawn to the organization by its mission. Um, but I think the two things that I would single out um, first is our incredible staff. Meredith, you mentioned your staff too. And we have everybody on our team from PhDs to, to people who have their GEDs. Um, it's the full range, but they all come to work every day and they bring their head and their heart and their soul uh, and they pour it into our mission. And it's, it's a great agency to run. It's just, it, it inspires me and motivates me when I see how hard they're working at it. Um, the second piece I think is our clients. Um, and, and witnessing their courage. And I use that word deliberately um, because they come to us seeking shelter, which we give them, but then we ask a whole lot more out of them. We ask them essentially to change their lives, 
to make the life moves they need to make to be accountable for whatever it was that led them to homelessness in the first place so they never go homeless again. And changing your life is the hardest work that there is. But here they are in the middle of trauma with their families and with their loved ones, and they take those steps. They work with us with all the programming, whether it's mental health counseling or addiction issues um, or how they work with their family, how they work with their kids, um, how they learn to, you know, basic financial management, whatever it takes, they do that hard work. Um, and because of that, they are successful. And we help them along the way, but we are very much you know, a hand up and not a hand out. Um, so when I see how brave they are in terms of changing their lives, look, I work from a different shelter one day every week. And I do that not just to stay in touch with what's going on in the field in our organization, but I do it for personal reasons, because it gives me the chance to see our staff and our clients in action. Uh, and that's what motivates me to want to stick around for many, many more years with this agency and do, do this hard work. But now I'm going to kick it back to you, because <laughs> Melissa and I were talking, and she thinks you need to answer the question, too. Do I still have to answer the question? Yes, you do. <laughs> I mean, this, that, that's what you just said is what gets me fired up. I, we got into this work because, and we, we come at it from knowing that we are not the experts at Tipping Point. We're out there trying to find the experts and find the groups that are on the ground doing the hard work and we've never for once thought to ourselves, we know better than our groups. We know that you guys are on the ground working incredibly hard, serving, you know, you told me 700 people tonight you will serve and house. Um, that's not something that a foundation can do without an unbelievable partner like Life Move. So, you know, it's, it's trite, but it's what's kept me going for me personally going for 12 years in this work is that, you know, we have 44 groups that we have ultimate faith in. And, and this is really hard work, as you just said. And so um, it's just an honor to partner with, with you and your team in this work. So that's what keeps me going. Well, and that, that's a nice segue to the, the, the last question I wanted to ask you before we move to some of the audience questions on the cards. Um, you work with 44 different agencies. Uh, Meredith, you have a ton of different organizations that you can partner with. John, I know your foundation partners with a lot of great agencies. You all have choices in who you choose to partner with. So for giving a self-serving question, why life moves? Be well, I'll, I'll just quickly say, I mean, you all in this room know the work. Um, 17 different shelters that you all run, 700 families tonight. You do, you, you do, you deliver these services at scale and with great services. You're willing to measure results. You're willing to take a hard look at what you're doing and if something's not working, get better at it. We always push one of your team members. <laughs> I won't name them said that we're as much of a pain in the ass as we are a positive funder, um, <laughs> which he said was, you know, so I take, we, we take, I took joy in hearing that because we push you guys hard, um, but we hope it's worth it in that we provide general operating support and our team led by Melissa comes in and we try to help you with the measurement piece. Uh, and this should be run like a business. You come from the business world. Nonprofits need to run more effectively, more efficiently, and so when we see a group like Life Moves, that fits into what we're looking for, because you guys do the hard work, you're doing great work, and you also know that you can get better. And so you're always open to that, and that's why we're so fortunate and honored to partner with you. Thank you. And I would, I would say, I visited one of the, met with Life Moves about, a, I think, a year, year and a half ago, and visited one of the, um, I mean, called a shelter, one of the, the homes that families live in. And what I, what, the reason we connected so much with Life Moves and the reason we're so proud to partner with you on our families is that it's what you said about honoring families and the power of families. We are not here to save families. Um, families are saving themselves. We are here to empower and support and partner. And Life Moves lives that ethos so deeply that it is, it really honors the inherent power of any human being and, and treats them with dignity and 
to honor their inherent capacity to support themselves. And I, having, we've all worked with a lot of organizations that work with families, and that is not true of every organization that works with families, um, particularly families who are, are as, have been degraded as much as some homeless families have. I think that there are many people who view them as really the bottom of the human ladder, and they're of course not. And Life Moves has been a great partner in seeing the value of every human being, bringing p families to a place where they can support themselves and that they can be everything they can be. And that's what we believe in too, so we really appreciate it. And uh, as far as our foundation is concerned, likewise the tipping point, we're in the 25 to $30 million a year in annual grants. A, a very good percentage of that uh, goes to organizations that have proven there's, can be successful, and certainly Life Moods is up there on the top. One thing that we do on our general, general operating support grants is we make them matching grants. In order, we'll make a two-year grant, and in order for that organization to obtain the second year, they have to prove to us that they were able to match our grant with new donors, new money from new donors, or for increased contributions from their existing donor base. And we've been doing this for years, and everybody makes their match. And that's a good way for us to measure how successful the agency is. That's a perfect no, John. <laughs> for our transition to, uh, to the questions from the audience, because while you guys are finishing filling out your question cards, and we'll collect them, um, I just wanted to take a moment to give you an opportunity to help us raise money so we can make our match for the Sobrato Foundation for next year. Um, here's, here's how you can act today. Um, if you want to take advantage of a dollar for dollar match that we have in the room today, thanks to our generous host committee, uh, and so you can help support Life Moves for all of the reasons that our panelists just so eloquently stated. Um, couple things to do. First, remember the number that Daniel just mentioned. Tonight, there are 700 people who will put their heads on pillows under our roofs, and half of those will be children. Second, please remember that we get great support from our public sector partners, like the County of Santa Clara, and that helps us to keep the doors open and to keep the lights on, but it's not nearly enough to do what we need to do. And third, you know, please understand that it is private money mostly from people who are just like you, that funds all the intensive case management services that our clients depend on to become accountable for the factors that cause their loss of housing and to help them succeed in overcoming that. So your generosity is what makes it possible for us to be able to return 92% of the families and 78% of the individuals who finish our transitional programs to get them back to stable housing and to self-sufficiency. So when you invest in Life Moves, you're not just investing in shelter. You're investing in a solution that actually breaks the cycle of homelessness for these families and individuals and keeps them from coming back through experiencing repeat episodes and ongoing trauma. But that only happens if we all step up as private donors to match the public investment if we truly collaborate in supporting a solution that works. So please find this card that's on your table. Uh, one side you'll see has examples of how your gift will make a tangible impact in the lives of our clients. And conveniently, on the other side of the card, you can use this to make your pledge or contribution today. And please remember again that every dollar you donate today is going to be matched dollar for dollar by our host committee. When you filled out that contribution card, you can put it in the basket on your table or drop it off with one of our amazing staff after the program concludes. Now I know that writing all those zeros and all those commas is gonna take a little bit of time. <laughs> so we'll give you a moment to finish filling that out while we finish sorting out the question cards and then we'll be back to pitch your questions to the panel and the program will continue. We can go to the questions here and we'll try to get through as many of your questions as we can. Um, and for those that we can't, I will take them back. We're going to read all of them. We get a lot of great ideas and a lot of great perspective from all of your feedback. Okay, here's an easy question to start with. Um, I appreciate all of the panelists' hard work and optimism, 
But when I see the news coming from Washington, D.C., I worry that major cuts are coming to safety net programs. What happens then? Daniel, you want to start? Uh, we have to fight harder. Uh, we have to come together. I think, you know, Washington, what's going on in, in our country politically is, you know, it's a tense time. It's uncertain. Obviously, we're divided. Uh, and so I think actually we need to look for leadership at home. We need to look for leadership in our business community, which we have on this stage. We need to look for business, for leadership from our nonprofit leaders. I think the employees at the companies around here need to see their CEOs and their leadership teams stepping up. Uh, and actually, I, I think we're seeing some of that. And we're going to have to definitely deal with cuts to the safety net. And so private dollars will never match those cuts. But if we come together as one community, and I know, once again, this is, you know, maybe it's, it's just lip service, but I really do believe that if a community holds tight, looks for leadership within, um, we can weather the next few years in terms of budget cuts or whether it's longer than that. Um, we've been through hard times before as a country, and we take care of our community. And I, to be quite honest, I actually see a lot of optimism coming out of these pretty divided times. I see a lot of momentum. I see people out protesting who were not aware of the political dynamics over the last decade. I see young people um, wanting to get more involved in their community, wanting to volunteer, wanting to join boards of organizations. Um, and so uh, I think there's a lot of upside of the downside. You can second that? OK. Um, here's one, and I think this is one that John alluded to earlier. Uh, many people who support homeless shelters and affordable housing still don't want these facilities in their neighborhood. How can we solve the housing problem if there are so many NIMBY people and NIMBY cities? Well, the city council that has to make a decision would be very much influenced if as many folks showed up in support of a project as those that show up and object. And like I said in the beginning of my remarks, all of you in this room are passionate about the issue. Uh, talk to your neighbors, ask them to show some compassion, ask them to come with you to a council meeting and go to the podium and say, you know, folks on the council, this is something we need to do. It's the right thing to do. Yeah, sure. So up in San Francisco, we, we have a dream that we're talking about piloting sites and, and finding sites is probably the hardest part of this work right now in terms of building more 100% supportive housing. And so I would like to see all 11 supervisors up in San Francisco raise their hand and say, I will put a 100% supportive housing in my district. And so everyone across the board is a yes in my backyard instead of a no in my backyard. Because people say, oh, I don't want homeless people living in my neighborhood. Well, in San Francisco, there are homeless people living in your neighborhood right now. So <laughs> let's house them. That's great. Thank you. OK, this one might be for me. Um, what can a small group of my friends and family do specifically to support Life Moves in its work for tangible resources? It's a great question. Um, there's a lot of things you can do beyond just the financial contribution. Where's my friend Amy Wright? There's Amy in the back of the room. Amy, wave your hand. Amy and her team, she's our head of development, do a remarkable job getting volunteers involved at every level of our organization. Last year, we had over 16,000 different individuals who worked with us in our 17 shelters. We couldn't get our work done without our volunteer base. So whether it's folks who are running the kitchen at the Opportunity Services Center, who I think have a whole table here, to the support committees at our family shelters, to the corporations that adopt our individual shelters. There's plenty of room for involvement. I will stick around after this program as long as anybody needs. Uh, but find me, find Amy. If you've got a group of people who wants to get involved, it's a great way to go. I remember the first year I was on the job, like three weekends into the job, 
Um, our friends at Menlo Church did their big action weekend where they worked at all the different sites. And so my job was just to go around and say thank you to all of them. And I went to our Maple Street shelter, um, and there was this very lovely um, older couple, um, and I was thanking them, and I said, we really appreciate your coming out this Sunday. And she just looked at me and said, young man, we're here every Sunday. <laughs> and there were four couples from the church, and they all like to get together every Sunday, but instead of going to Starbucks, they went to Maple Street Shelter and made breakfast for 75 people every Sunday for 12 years. So that's the kind of involvement we welcome. That's a great question. Let's see what's next. Changes in funding from federal government, less money. How will that affect the work of life moves in our community? You guys have any more crystal ball views of what you think might be coming specifically in terms of cuts to, to housing or other funds? <laughs> our only hope is that uh, you know, Governor Brown and the state legislature will have to increase taxes, I guess, on all of us in order to pick up the loss of revenue that has been paid by the federal government. We'll see. You know, it's anybody's guess what's going to happen in Washington. Yeah. yeah I, I think that's a good point is that we've seen shifts in priorities within housing and urban development from time to time, um, sometimes more towards permanent housing and away from the kind of shelters that we operate. But wherever we've seen a shift to date um, in federal funding, we've been very fortunate that the counties we live in and work with, San Mateo County and Santa Clara County, have generously, generously stepped in to fill that gap. So we've been able to hold our own in terms of public sector funding, even though the mix has shifted in there between public and private. I think the risk we're worried about now from Washington is if the cuts become so severe that the county can't make them up, or if the counties get hit in other areas, like Medicaid, like healthcare, in a significant way that their resources become constrained, then we're gonna see a decrease in federal funding. Um, and then it's either John's suggestion, which is that the state of California has to step up its resources in these areas, or our suggestion that we rely more heavily on the private sector. We get great private sector support in Silicon Valley, but there's no place you'd rather be if you had to be dependent on private sector funding than in Silicon Valley. So I think we're just gonna need to ask our corporate partners and individuals and families who have the disposable income in this area to dispose a little bit more of that to help their neighbors um, if it comes to that, if we see federal cuts. Um, and I think you too, I wouldn't say it's necessarily optimism but I think there is a real sense that we're seeing now in our community for the first time that we may be on our own. We may have to rely on each other, but you also see people with confidence that we can rely on each other and we have the resources to solve these problems locally if we need to. It's a great question. Uh, with potential substantial coming limits to personal charitable contributions and deductibility, how do, a plan, how do you plan to adjust your development initiatives if necessary? Um, it's a good question. I'll tackle it briefly. We have three major components to our private sector fundraising. The biggest component, the most important to us, obviously, is individual giving. Uh, we also get significant support from corporations in our area, many of whom are underwriting the lunch here today, uh, and from foundations. Um, and some of our biggest foundation funders are represented on this panel. Um, but there are more corporations out there there are more foundations out there. Um, and so if we were to see changes in tax laws that impacted our individual giving, we would look to increase our, our fundraising in those other areas. Um, yeah. I think, Daniel, you once at an event suggested that the coming changes in tax laws were an incentive for people to give. To give yeah. now so you can give deduct. Now. But we, I mean, over the last few months, and, and, and John's right, we can, there's no, no one can guess what's gonna come out of DC these days, but um, you know we're hopeful that the charitable tax deduction does not go away. We, we've we've heard that it's unlikely to be altered, and if it is, it hopefully wouldn't be substantial. That's the latest, but obviously we don't know. Great. Here's one that talks about the linkages. What are some of the models you have seen of schools tackling the issue of homelessness or affordable housing among teachers and families? 
Yeah, we when we started this work, we we looked across the country, and the the housing issue has only gotten worse since we started forming our model. But um, but I think there's actually some exciting things happen. I think one the idea that you need to support families in order to support children is not, was not invented by the primary school. That's something that a lot of schools have tackled, and it goes everything. There's a there's some really interesting research actually on schools that have put in washers and dryers in their buildings, and as such a very small measure, um, something that we're really proud our local school district is doing now to, and that being a barrier to coming to school. If you're homeless and you can't come in clean clothes, what does that feel like to be there during the day? So I actually think there's a little bit of, just a little bit of low hanging fruit um, happening there. There's also some really great work going on in San Francisco with the school system there. They are um, pursuing teacher housing, which I know doesn't seem directly connected, but keeping housing for our very underpaid teaching workforce is incredibly key to supporting our children. Um, and I think there are also some really innovative models. Um, we've seen some models in New York which really focus on other children with housing issues such as foster children, who we would consider that a housing issue as well because of the chaotic household and providing additional supports which include mental health services, which I, I mentioned before. There's also a new school in LA that's opening that is specifically targeting um, homeless teenagers and they have a, a mobile model, which I think is actually really exciting. So there's some, there's some good stuff happening with schools. Great, thank you. Uh, could John elaborate on the problem with developer fees for affordable housing? How could these fees be used to address this housing problem? And what should we do as residents to be advocating in our cities? Well, the issue on the development fees uh, for, uh, in lieu fees for affordable housing is a lot of these sitting cities uh, here in the valley are sitting on millions of dollars in fees that have already been collected in lieu fees. And unfortunately, the cities are taxed on where they're going to put this housing. And every city has a little excess parcel here and there that they might be able to devote towards affordable housing. And uh, it'd be nice to see uh, all the cities in the county do that uh, to date. Uh, I can only think of, uh, I think the city of Sunnyvale has probably been the most successful there. Uh, the question is, if you're building an affordable project, uh, let's see what it, if you're going to build a market rate project, you can normally absorb about 15% of those units to be below market without raising the price, uh, the rental price or the purchase price of the market rate units beyond people is a, a people's ability to pay. But if you're trying to get down into the 50% or lower uh, average median income, there you need to have a subsidy. And so instead of providing money uh, to go out and buy a site to create more housing, those cities that don't have those uh, opportunities could apply that money that's sitting in their accounts for an in lieu project to subsidize the rents of these folks that um, are in the uh, lower income brackets. Um, that's about the only other solution I can think of. Great, thank you. There's two questions that are related that kind of go more towards culture or thinking. Let me read them both and you can pick up either piece that you want. One asks, we all see the problem, but less than 1% of our community thinks about it. So this is not a funding problem. Do we need a different way of thinking? Maybe social engineering. And then another person asks, how do we overcome the information and empathy gap between different parts of our region? We are interconnected, but the peninsula, San Jose, San Francisco, and Alameda are like you know distant countries, different cultures, governments, allies, et cetera. So how do we change people's thinking and how do we start to address these problems from a regional perspective? Well, the Bay Area Council is working on that mm -hmm. precisely. Uh, I'm a member of that council and also a joint venture Silicon Valley. You know, so it's a long slog, frankly, to bring all these various uh, counties together. I mean, they can't even get Sam Trans to talk to VTA for a bus <laughs> line down El Camino. I mean, come on. I mean, it's that difficult. 
so you, I, now I'm hesitating to bring this up. I, so I was the chair of the Super Bowl 50 host committee, and uh, yeah, I should, <laughs> I should have brought it up. But we got, we, got, um, we got the mayors from all of these cities to talk and to work together. We got transportation, the MTA, to get the 30 or 40 different transportation agencies to work together. We moved people around the Bay pretty well for a regional effort. We had people staying all over the place. I think it has to come from our political leaders. The, the, ma the three major mayors need to play a huge role in bringing this community together. And once again, private sector, the business sector has to go at this problem because the employees at these companies want to know what their companies are doing to improve the lives of those living in poverty here in the Bay Area. We are seeing the tw the, those that are in their 20s and 30s do care about these issues. I don't, I don't agree with the 1%, actually. Th I think it's much higher than that. I think we are a compassionate region, much more so than many other parts of this country. I, I truly believe that. And we have the ability to connect people digitally and socially, and we just have to do it really well. We have to tell a compelling story online, digitally, and we have to also improve our transportation systems. And I agree with you. I think, you know, the ride sharing and the driverless cars are definitely coming. At, I mean, they're here, but they will play a role, but we have to make it easier to get from here to San Francisco instead of an hour and a half, two hours up, which I'm expecting when I leave here today. <laughs> um, and then people will feel more connected. So more housing, more dense housing, more people living close together, people being able to get to work from deep in the East Bay into San Francisco in 30 to 45 minutes instead of two hours. Uh, and so then you have people that are interacting and, and commuting together, and I think that helps. Great. Uh, and mindful of time, and we promise to get you out of here on time, let me wrap up with one last question. Um, asking about the greatest obstacles to public-private collaboration, and I think I'd like to turn this around a bit and just talk about one of the great opportunities in terms of collaboration by telling a story I promised not to tell about our panelists. When we were planning this call, we were so excited we got these three folks together. We said we should hold a quick conference call just to prepare and give them all the information. And the hardest thing in the world, harder than Samtrans and VTA, is finding one hour on the calendar that all three of these very busy people are free. But we managed to do that a few weeks back. Um, and we planned carefully how we were going to go through the program and explain everything and get everybody prepared for this discussion. And I think we got about four minutes into the conversation before I lost complete control. Um, and the reason was because John Sobrato wanted to talk to Meredith Liu about literacy in East Palo Alto and how we could increase that. And Daniel Lurie wanted to talk to John Sobrato about how we can reuse shipping containers to provide affordable housing for homeless people in San Francisco. So they spent the rest of the hour doing what they do every day, collaborating, brainstorming, and solving problems in our community. And I think, frankly, that's the kind of collaborative leadership coming from f leaders like this that's going to help us work our way through some of these very difficult problems. So please join me in thanking John Sobrato, Meredith Liu, and Daniel Lurie. I'm happy to stick around afterwards and talk with anybody who wants to learn more specifically about life moves in our model. We'll get you out of here on time. Don't forget to drop your contribution cards in the baskets or at the door, and we'll see you all back here next year for our next Thought Leader Luncheon. Thank you very much.